Them there in Kingston, run out uh, when I'm searching for food for we part. Uh, we started off with Dirt's Man, hot this year. What am I gonna do for a war me? And then we uh, had a short, uh, encouraging and discouraging message from Vandana Shiva. Um, and then Dr. Vandana Shiva, pardon me. And then we moved on to uh, Supercot, Ghetto Red Hot. Uh, when I'm searching for food for them pots. Anyway, I don't know if you've been following the Bro Diallo show, but you notice I've changed my strategy. Since last week, because the temperature is unduly, unnecessarily cold, I decided to play ice-themed music. I played Ice Cube. I played Ice T. I played MC Chill. I played Cold Cold World by the Jizza. It was just so many ice songs, cold related songs in hip hop. I said I was going to do that until the weather flipped. So I didn't know, you know, I, uh, over the weekend I wrote, I read The Secret. And I found out that I was doing things the wrong way. In my protest of the unseasonably cold temperature that I think I'm fearful for my beats. Every night I weep for my beats. I reap for my collards. You know, I tried to get jump, I tried to get, get jumpy, I tried to get quick with it on, on the planting season. And I planted some, some uh, I, I know, I just know my damn uh, gourds have died. I wanted a lush vine, you know, decorative vining. And I've been playing all this cold, ice, freezing themed music. And I found out from Oprah and The Secret that I've been doing it wrong. I've been putting cold energy into the universe when I should have been putting out heat energy. You don't tell the universe, you don't complain to the universe. You tell the universe, send I abundance. You tell the universe what you want. You don't complain about what you got to the universe. Did it all wrong. And because of that, last night, there was a snowstorm, a blizzard. And I know Prince says sometimes it snows in April, but what does he know? So this year I'm, I'm trying a new strategy. Until the temperature gets up to the normal side, I'm just going to play heat, hot theme music. So we played hot this year. What am I going to do for whore me? And we played ghetto red hot when we're searching for food food with pot. So we're going to try to go the other way. You know, we're going to ask the universe for what we want instead of complaining to the universe about what we got. And that goes for everything, not just for unseasonably cold weather. That also, I guess, goes for oppression, slavery, poverty. All of y'all sending out the wrong energy, the wrong vibrational frequencies to the universe. And I now I am a believer. I am a believer because I played cold music. That was all me, y'all. Sorry, Chicago. Sorry, Wisconsin. Sorry, Indiana. That's Bro Diallo. I brought that code upon us by sending out code vibes to the universe because that's how the world works. So now it's going to be a hot song. So we can look forward to, even though my gourds have died, even though maybe my beets and my turnips and my collards, my spinach. I wasn't going to plant spinach this early, but uh, Dr. Mingo planted some spinach. I said it's too early for spinach. Chicago don't play like that. So we'll see. We'll see what died, what froze to death, and what we'll have to replant. And Chauncey and uh, I were out there prepping bins, but I was like, let's not plant nothing else until we get on the other side of this, this unseasonably cold weather. So we'll see. We'll see. You know, I, I can just imagine. They said uh, with climate change, we're going to be having food shortages and crop failures. So it might be starting with the HF Garden, organic urban agriculture. Might be the first major climate change crop failure. But that ain't nothing to play with. That's why I played Vandana Shiva. If you don't know Dr. Vandana Shiva, read her journal articles, her books. Go online and look for her lectures. I mean, this woman, I mean, she's been banging on this beast for so long. And I think she should be better known. Enough respect. Shout out to Vandana Shiva. But moving on. Julian Shange is locked up. <laughs> Julian said 
if he gets locked up, all bets are off. And I, I assume we all know who Julian Assange is, right? He's been held up in the uh, Ecuadorian embassy for the last almost a decade, like seven years. They had this dude locked up. Spinach will be fine. Okay, and said my spinach will be fine. So if my spinach ain't fine, I guess I can come to you and complain directly to you. But moving on. Julian Assange got locked up. Now, for the longest time, up until the 2016 election, I had some respect for Julian Assange. I, I haven't lost all respect for Julian Assange, but I'll give you, Julian Assange is the curator, one of the co-founder, the co curator of WikiLeaks. And WikiLeaks is a website that was founded. It's not even a, just a website anymore. It's transcendent being just a website. It is a community. It is a movement. It is an idea that people in power should not be allowed to operate in secret. That the people who govern us, the people who rule us, the people who profit from our labor, the people who own the means of of production should be accountable to the masses. And the only way to hold the elites accountable is by exposing their actions, by exposing not just their actions, but their motivations. So WikiLeaks has almost in a cultish drive sought to expose corporate government slash military corruption, agendas, and all things that people in power seek to keep secret, seek to hide from the people. So I, myself, am like cool in the game. I'm with that. It's kind of like uh, what I would imagine that Anonymous would be doing more of. But Anonymous went from, you know, focusing on elites and governments to, to, to trying to bang on problematic celebrities. Remember, Anonymous promised to take down Kanye. It's not the most noble agenda, but hell, they didn't even do that. What's up, Anonymous? But then Anonymous kind of aligned with Tech 9 <laughs> Weird stuff. I, I don't claim to understand this world. You know, I, I, I'm just a squirrel trying to get a nut. I, I, the things that go on in this world don't make sense to me. And the more you know, the less sense make, things make. But I digress. So Julian Assange was out there uh, puttering away for, for a few years, just doing his thing, traveling the world. He was essentially a journalist, what they called back then a muckraker. Muckrakers were journalists who went and dug up dirt. You know, the kind of guys with, 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 with the dingy trench coat and the Stetson hat and the gnawed up cigar and a notepad, maybe a camera. And so they'd go out there and just dig up dirt. And they, were, and they took very serious this concept of the fifth estate. And the fifth estate was supposed to be the non-governmental aspect of government that holds the government accountable. But anyway, traditional journalism. And but, you know, with a digital edge. So anyway, back in the, during the Bush administration, this is when WikiLeaks became known to people outside of, outside of just the, the techno sphere and, and people, the kind of people who follow government corruption and international politics and corporate espionage and corporate corruption. Out when when. When WikiLeaks and Julian Assange became known to the general public, the masses, was when, with the release of this thing called the collateral murder tapes. And here's the thing. Let me just put this out here before I, I say anything more. We, everything, absolutely everything that WikiLeaks puts out is stuff that people already know. They just didn't have the capacity to, to lay the evidence out. But if you are a person who knows anything about the history of governments, the motivation of governments, the history of the elites, the history of capitalism, and the motivation drives and the necessities, the things that capitalism needs to do to exist, absolutely nothing that WikiLeaks has ever released has ever shocked me or even upset me. 
I, I every time WikiLeaks does a major what they call a dump, they take all these files and they give them to the Washington Post and the New York Times and they just put them out on various websites. I mean, I almost have to shrug. But anyway, let me get back to my point. But let me just say, WikiLeaks confirms what uh, people already know. But I digress. Julian Assange released this thing called the Collateral Murder Tape. And this tape was given to him by... Uh, Chelsea Manning. Chelsea Manning is a transgender woman who at the time was Bradley Manning. And Bradley Manning was a intelligence officer. And Bradley Manning's job was just to collect information, collect data, correlate the data, and, you know, put together these, these quarterly reports. Just mundane. He wasn't out there busting off shots, cocking his Glock. You know, being a, 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 a fodder for the empire. But he had a certain clearance level for intelligence information. And that's one thing, you go all the way back to the British Empire. For some reason, I've said this before, the one thing, if you're going to be oppressed by anybody, you should be oppressed by the British. Or the Germans. Less so the Spaniards, the Portuguese, you, oh, the Dutch, okay. There's certain people that you that oppress, certain genocidal colonial oppressor, oppressors that are absolutely obsessed with keeping records. I don't know what this is. They love to die. I, I think it's like porn to them. But you go all the way back to the British. You go back to the uh, British East India Company. You go back to the suppression of the Mau Mau. You go back to the Boer Wars. You even go back to the colonial era America. When the British first set up their colonies and they would account how many Indians they slaughter, how many Indians they decapitate, rape, how many beaver pelts were secured. They are very big on keeping records. It's weird. You know, I got a little something to say about that a little later too about this dude who worshiped the elites and his impression of what makes the elite the elite. And this is supposed to be a conscious black man. But I digress. Let me stop saying that. I, let's pro I progress. Anyway, they keep very good records of their crimes dating back to their earliest ventures, all the way back to the Crusades. They almost accounted for every, you know, Bedouin girl that was raped and every gold, ruby, and, 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 and diamond that they stole. It's weird. They keep records. And I think that comes from a culture of mistrust. That's just my speculation. There's no trust amongst Europeans. So everything has to be written down. You can't, you know, just take somebody at their word. So if you got a deep-seated culture based on lies and deception and exploitation, parasitism. I guess one of the good things that come of that is a lot of records. So anyway, our American oppressors, our American overlords, they are descendants, white Anglo-Saxon Protestants from the British. Even though they got their quote unquote freedom from the British, they beat King George and had the emancipate, not the emancipation, Lord have mercy, the declaration of independence, they still brought a lot of Western traditions they held on to. So, you know, America becoming an independent nation was not a break from Europe. It was an expansion of Europe. I wish the ADOS would understand this. That's why you can never be a full-on American if you're not European. But I progress. So anyway, they had this tradition of keeping records that they have held on to. So Europeans as they go about the world in their conquest, genocidal conquest, they're keeping records. So anyway, that was good for Julian Assange. It keeps him in business. And so Bradley Manning back then, Chelsea Manning now, so if you Google it, you might get a little confused. Maybe. If you haven't been following the story. But Bradley Manning, Chelsea Manning, same person, 
Bradley Manning had gender reassignment and it's now Chelsea Manning. And which, which is part of, you know, the Obama administration actually used that against them. But anyway, in 2007, Chelsea Manning gave this video of U.S. soldiers deliberately murdering unarmed Iraqi civilians and children. And not only were they murdering unarmed Iraqi, the first they shot up and killed these journalists because the journalists on the ground in Iraq were reporting on U.S. war crimes. And so they shot up a, a, a van that was clearly marked press. And there were two children in that van because the journalist brought his children out with him. And so they fired on the van. They saw that the people weren't armed. And then when the people were trying to escape, they fired on the people trying to escape. And then there was an ambulance that came, an emergency first responders that came to try to rescue. One of the little children was shot in the abdomen. They saw their father's corpse. It was a mess. So they pull up to try to rescue the people, their first responders. And also, the ambulance was clearly marked. It was not a military vehicle. It was a civilian first responder rescue vehicle. They pull up, boom, 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 and they shoot at them. And you could hear the psychopaths in the military, thank you for your service, the U.S. servicemen that we have all this patriotic love for, that some of y'all worship. They're making jokes. They're making racist jokes. To them, it's a video game as they're murdering people and firing on first responders, firing on ambulances, firing on, deliberately firing on civilians, all of that is against the Geneva Code. So basically, Bradley Manning, on a daily basis, was going into work and seeing atrocities, and he said, I got to do something. I'm sorry. I guess back then when it happened, but I guess Chelsea Manning. Chelsea Manning was seeing all these atrocities every day, and so she took a, a Britney Spears tape. I don't know why they always emphasize that it was a Britney Spears mixtape or something. Brought in a, a CD, and I don't know if it was truly a Britney Spears CD or, or she just disguised it to look like a Britney Spears CD. But that was always every story you read back then, over 10 years ago, damn. Every story you read was like Britney Spears, there was a Britney Spears, it smuggled in a Britney Spears CD. So gave it over and WikiLeaks bravely put it out. Like boom, boom, there it is. America's committing war crimes, killing civilians. Everybody who follows US imperialism is like no duh. Every single war. I mean, who the hell was thought that the United States was in Iraq fighting for democracy, fighting for freedom, fighting for anything other than oil? I guess the same people who believe that the US is, is, is uh, gearing up to invade and attacking Venezuela, engaging in economic warfare and sabotage of their infrastructure for the freedom uh, of the Venezuelans, for democracy. I guess if people believe that, I mean, but anyway, which shows that Bush, the Pentagon, uh, what's your boy's name, Colin Powell, were all freaking complicit in atrocities and war crimes. And now you had the evidence. You had more than speculation. But even before that, you had Dar Jamil, who went over there, another journalist, who dropped everything, went over there and saw things on the ground. And he reported on the rape of, or, or massacre in Fallujah, you know, uh, massacres in Janine, all throughout the Middle East. So there was already writing, but there was nothing. So And Americans don't read. These are literary journalists. Americans don't read. But this was a video. And so the United States said, we're going to get Julian Assange. Because they claimed that when Julian Assange released these atrocities, he put U.S. servicemen at risk. Meaning that that was, number one, that was classified information. And the reason it was classified is because if people saw that the U.S. troops were committing murders and rape and other deliberate atrocities, and war crimes, then people might want to, it would strengthen the resistance. And so strengthening the resistance puts U.S. servicemen in danger. And if you deliberately put U.S. servicemen in danger in a time of war, you have committed an act of treason. 
But if you're a non-citizen, you can't commit treason. So they said it was espionage. And they were like, well, it's not even espionage because this is legitimate journalism. So they came up with trumped up charges for Julian Assange saying that he raped a woman or that he sexually assaulted a woman. And then there was two women. And then they found out that the woman he was accused of sexually assaulting actually went on two or three more dates after the alleged assault. So anyway, Julian Assange saw the writing on the wall. He saw just like with the war in Iraq, the United States just comes up with all these excuses. Remember, they went to Iraq because they had weapons of mass destruction. Then they went to Iraq to protect Kuwait. And then they went to Iraq to, 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 for the benefit of the people, of, to liberate the people from tyranny. And then they were in Iraq to fight terrorism that didn't exist in Iraq before the U.S. Same thing. They went to Afghanistan to avenge 9-11. And then they went to well, the 9-11 vengeance. They found out that the uh, Taliban leadership said, listen, if you show us evidence that, uh, um, that 9-11, that, that uh, Osama bin Laden had anything to do with 9-11, we will, take, we will arrest him and send him to the international court because this is a global crime. You can't declare war on us because you can't declare war on a nation because the crime of an individual. If I went to Spain, if I went to Portugal, if I went to, 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 to uh, Nigeria, if I went to Panama, if I went to Canada and committed a terrorist act, that would not allow Canada or any of the countries where I commit a terrorist act to declare war on the United States because I was not acting on behalf of the United States. And then if they wanted to bring me to charges because I'm not a citizen of their nation, they would have to go to the international court. And so the Taliban, remember these crazy, bloodthirsty, foaming at the mouth, Islamic fundamentalist monsters? They were like, listen, white man, here's the laws you gave us. These are the laws you set up the International Criminal Court. You set up the UN. You run, uh, 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 um, what they call the, in the, the, the global police. I can't, the name escapes me now. Uh, Interpol. That's it. You run Interpol, and then you got the FBI, CIA, NSA, MI6, Mossad. You got all these intelligence agencies that collect all this data. You literally have a global surveillance system up in the upper stratosphere. You got satellites watching everything we do. Well, we barely, you know, Afghanistan barely had an airport. And he's like, so when you got all this surveillance, all this intelligence, show us your evidence that Saddam Hussein or Al-Qaeda committed the 9-11 attacks and we will serve him up to you on a platter. And Bush said, nope, we don't want, we, what are you, you're less than humans, you're sand niggers. You're not worthy of, how dare you question me or ask me for evidence, you should take my word, my word is law, my word is God. But whenever you accuse Almighty Whitey of something, you better have your T's crossed and your I's dotted. But when they go to other people and say, give us people, turn your people over to us. But then we see, thanks to Julian Assange and many others, that U.S. committed atrocities all over the world. And they, you let those countries come and say, well, your citizen came and committed a severe atrocity, a terrorist attack in our land. Can you give them to us? Nope. So anyway, that's another example of the U.S. severe genocidal hypocrisy. But I digress. Anyway, they kept coming up with all these different reasons. And, and then ultimately, Barbara Bush said the reason that the United States invaded, because they didn't have evidence, they've never presented us evidence that Saddam was behind Osama. They didn't present any evidence for, for what they accused Saddam either, that Saddam was harboring or hoarding ma weapons of mass destruction. No evidence. No evidence that the to Taliban or Al-Qaeda or Osama bin Laden is actually directly, deliberately responsible for the 9-11 attacks. They never gave us evidence. Y'all just assume they must have told us something. They must have shown us something. I saw two towers come down like they were full of explosives fall into its own footprint. Whatever. But we're not going to open that can of worms. But they never gave us evidence. But Bush, the Democrats and the Republicans said, you know, believe the government, which I never do. I'm still waiting on evidence. I never claim that I know what happened. But y'all like cover-ups. 
Y'all letting Trump do this dirty little collusion, Russian collusion cover up. But I, I, I progress. My goodness. I, so many layers to this mess. Mess upon mess. I mean, this is a multi-layer feces cake. I, I can't keep up. But anyway, I'll try to stay on Julian. So anyway, they wanted Julian Assange. But Julian Assange hadn't committed any crimes as far as releasing. Because also, by law, international law, you cannot you classify, use the, 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 the law or the policy of classifying, making information classified in order to cover up crimes. You can classify information, sensitive information, proprietary information, if it is a threat to your national security or if it is, you know, intellectual property issues and other things like that. The government has a wide, wide range for which it can use to classify information. But one of the things they cannot use the classification laws for is to cover up crimes. So you can't say, well, I'm going to classify this video. Why? Because it's a crime in the video and I don't want to go to jail. That is an abuse, misuse, misappropriation of classified information. So a lot of times if people challenge it, if you go, which you're supposed to do in theory, which doesn't happen very often. But let's say the government says we classify this data, this file, this document, this video, this image. And you go and say, well, you have to, I'm going to submit a FOIA. And then they have to go to court and say, well, we can't release this information because, and explain why. And they can't say we can't release this information because it'll prove that I committed a crime and I don't want to go to jail. Can't do it. But anyway, they said that Julian Assange committed a crime, which he didn't. He didn't violate, not only did he not violate international law, he did not violate U.S. law. He offended the U.S., he embarrassed the U.S., but embarrassing or offending is not the same as breaking the law. In fact, he was well within the law. And if he broke the law, then they would have to lock up all the journalists at the New York Times, you know, and all many other papers, Chicago Tribune, Chicago Sun-Times, all these people who took WikiLeaks uh, information and published it. They would have to lock up CNN and even their beloved Fox News. Everybody go to jail if Julian Assange committed a crime because everybody who, you know, if I go and steal something or if I go and cop a brick and then I give that brick to somebody else and they give everybody that comes into contact that interacts with that brick or interacts with that stolen property is, is culpable in the crime to receive or buy stolen property. But anyway, so they tried to say Julian Assange committed a crime. Then they tried to rewrite and say, well, he's not a journalist. He's a hacker. Like, uh, he's still a journalist. And you don't even have evidence that he specifically, he received stolen video footage and stolen classified files. But he didn't steal them. And they said, well, he solicited them. So they said that a journalist can't solicit classified information, meaning he can't go and say, yo, you got anybody got any data? Anybody got any dirt on governments or corporations? Holla at your boy, especially, you know, the Bush administration. Holla at your boy and I'll publish it. So they called that solicitation. And so they tried to say the solicitation is different than investigation. I, they wanted, they were, they had a hard on for this dude. They hated Julian Assange. And for that reason alone, I'm like, good on you, Julian Assange. Shout out to Julian. Free my cracker, Julian. He ain't never do nothing. But he was hated back in the in, in the uh, mid 2000s. They was hating on dude, and that alone. That, that I've never read anything to come out of the Snowden, Chelsea and Maddie, and Julian, and none of that stuff. Are like <gasps> because I read the COINTELPRO papers, so I already knew that the government was a corrupt, murderous, criminal body. I read Dale Jones, the war correspondent. I knew about the atrocities everywhere from Panama to Honduras, throughout the African continent, in Israel. I knew. So when he came out with these documents, a lot of patriotic, red-blooded Americans, they dropped. They were standing over the grill cooking their pork. They dropped their spatulas. They ripped off their American flag aprons, and they just weeped. They pulled out their, their, their toxic white flower-enriched 
hamburger buns and just weeped into them. They just couldn't believe that America was committing crimes and atrocities and murders, that we're the bad guy. They just couldn't believe that America was the villain. America was the hero. America was the beacon of democracy. America was the shining city on the hill. So they hate Julian Assange, and also not so much because he told the truth, but because he shattered their delusions. And you shatter people's delusions, boy. And you think, I'm a truth teller. I put the facts out. They're going to love me. Nope. Nope. But anyway, Julian Assange, they couldn't get due. They kept trying to invent crimes. And all the international bodies were like, uh, he ain't done. He didn't do nothing. He hasn't committed any crimes. Now he hasn't broken your national laws. He hasn't broken international laws. Julian Assange is operating as a journalist. He's running a journalism website. And he's engaged in the same investigative, muck-raking journalist as all other journalists. So they went back and said, uh, he's a rapist. And let me say something else. And this is going to piss some people off. I know some people going to log off right now. But sisters, especially, and brothers who are allies of women, remember that whole Believe Women campaign? When it came to issues of rape and sexual assault? Believe women. Believe women. I don't think there should have been a Believe Women campaign. There should have been a Believe Black Women campaign. There should have been a Believe Native Women campaign. Hell, we could have had a Believe Arab and Believe Asian Women campaign. But that Believe Women campaign should have directly, specifically, and deliberately left out white women. Let me back away from the mic. That Believe Women campaign, and let me tell you something, black women, Asian women, Arab women, native women, aboriginal women, non-human female species, y'all better stop huddling up with white women for y'all causes. Y'all found out the white women were embraced and enveloped of, of, of the Me Too movement founded by black women, ignored by white women for years, and then white women got in, and then you find out the women who got at the helm of, of the Me Too movement, they were raping little boys. I'm, I'm backing away from the mic for a second. So, all women ain't women. All women are not created equal. All women are not treated equal. All women, some women are less equal than others. Some women are more equal than others. And some women, some classification and groupings and, and bodies of women are direct beneficiaries of the empire who have been unbroken, staunch allies of the empire, who engage in racism and profit from racism. And this is who, again, Howard Zinn called the intimately oppressed. And I think a lot of people think, it's just like, but uh, and let me not pick on women, gay people, a lot of black gays, Asian gays, Aboriginal gays, lesbian, LBGTQAI, same thing. Y'all want to have this like, and you think that white women, white gays, white disabled people, white religious minorities, they would say, well, we're going through all this, let's have some empathy. But every single time, and believing white women, white women have always been believed when they tell on non-whites. And white women, as soon as white women acknowledge this, then we, maybe we can have another conversation. When you say believe white women, no, disbelieve white women. Many black men, women, and children have been lynched. We just had a white woman in New York City of all places try to imitate this little 18-year-old chubby little black boy and accused him of groping or molesting her while she stood at a counter. And if, thank goodness, there were cameras just imagine if there were in-store cameras during the Emmett Till situation. They would have murdered him anyway, but at least we'd have, I don't know. So black women, don't be afraid to say, believe black women. Because y'all the ones that have not been believed. Even when, especially when the 
the, the woman is black and the man is white. Believe black women. And we know throughout history, believe white women, even when there's solid, concrete, irrefutable evidence that the black man didn't do nothing, they still believe the white woman. So I'm sorry to go down that path, but I'm just sick of sisters, y'all feminists. And now y'all talk about black feminism. And you cannot make something black by simply calling it black. If the founding ideology, if the founding concrete agenda is not black, calling it black on the back end don't make it black. It's just black people engaged in white folks behavior. But I, anyway, believe so when, it, when I join that campaign, if you can't say believe black women and you say believe women because you're afraid of isolating or alienating potential allies, you a punk and you're playing yourself. But I progress. Anyway, Julian Assange was, was falsely accused of, of rape and sexual assault. That's what they call a honeypot in the, in, in the uh, espionage. So they, they want Brother Diallo. They want compromising information on me. It's not even that they're going to use, but they just want to hold it because my influence becomes so great across this little low-power AM radio station. So they do a honeypot. They send somebody that, that fits the profiles of things I like. They send Grace Jones in a limo. I walk out the studio, and Grace Jones is sitting there in a limo. I've always kind of dug Grace Jones. And she's sitting there like, which, like she was in Boomerang. Come here. And then she get in there and seduces me. And then I go home, and then I got this thing over my head, like, oh, Lord, what have I done? And then they got me. Like, yo, bro, Diallo, you stop talking down on your government, your beloved government, and your beloved leader, of Donald Trump. You stop talking all that mess. And stop going back in the annals of history, talking about the crimes of the past that have packed us today. Stop talking about Obama. You should love Obama like every other blind, deaf, and dumb Negro. And I'm like, well, they got me. It's a honeypot. Grace Jones don't love me. She didn't want me. She just, she was sent there to, 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 have, to get me in a compromising situation. That's called a honeypot in the, the uh, when they use sex or sexual seduction or sexually compromise somebody so that they can get you with it. So Julian Assange was a victim of what is called a honeypot. So he knew it. He was like, I didn't rape nobody. I was already taken into custody. I already gave a statement. You, you guys released me and even let me legally travel abroad. And now all of a sudden, y'all bringing this stuff back up that has already been resolved. So he, he saw the writing on the wall. He said they tried to say I was a thief. They tried to say I was a, a, a spy, espionage. They said all this stuff about me. And now here they come with the honey pie. So he ran into the Venezuelan embassy. But at the time, the Venezuela was a liberal, progressive, independent, sovereign country. Right now, Venezuela is a punk-ass tool, a puppet regime of the United States. So Mike Pence and other U.S. dignitaries went to Venezuela and say, hey boy, now that we got you back on the leash, because Venezuela broke the leash during the Bolivarian Revolution era when many Latin American countries, excluding, uh, excluding Colombia, but Brazil, Chile, uh, of course Venezuela, and, and, and uh, Ecuador. Yeah, he was in the I'm confusing my embassies. Anyway, they went to, wait, did I say Venezuela? I wish he went, made it to Venezuela embassy. Ecuador, right, Ecuador. So they went to Ecuador and they put Ecuador back on the leash. And the, they, the leader of Ecuador, this guy named Lenin, believe it or not, his name is Lenin. He is no Lenin. It's because you're named after a revolutionary. Don't make you one, I suppose. But I'm named after a reactionary, so that don't make me reactionary. Yes, I'm saying Jomo Kenyatta was reactionary. You don't believe me? Go read Chin Wezu. He broke it all down. Jin Wezu told on everybody. The fake revolutionaries. He told, and even the real revolutionaries, he told their dirt. So Chin Wezu, if you want to know anything about African leadership from the deep colonial ever, read Chin Wezu. But I digress. Julius Assange was hiding in the embassy. He was safe. And the Ecuador at the time was like, Ecuador is a sovereign nation, an Ecuadorian embassy. I don't care if it's in the UK or US. It is sovereign territory. You will not violate us because we, we, you know, we got the dignity of nationhood. And just a year and a half ago, 
Like, oh, boss. Oh, boss. Whatever you want me to do. So they went and gave Venezuela some loans and some other uh, economic and trade uh, promises. Didn't even pay them off. Just... They, 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 they served him up and violated their own sovereignty, Venezuela, I mean, Ecuador. Venezuela, Ecuador violated its own sovereignty, disrespected its own embassy, disrespected itself before the, the world, and served up Julian Assange. And then punk-ass UK is acting as an enforcement arm of the U.S. So sovereignty is, is a myth right now. That's why it's so stupid to be like, I'm a descendant of an American. I'm an American descendant. It's so stupid to try to claim any set. Because now the people who rule us are what they call supranational. National. Supra, S-U-P-R-A, national. Not super, but supranational. Meaning they are above nations. Multinational corporations and global elites have no loyalty to any nation. It's only us poor wretches, the wretches of the earth. Rednecks and poor black folks talking about America, USA, USA. While these guys are, 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 it's like, it's planet Earth. We run and own the Earth. Forget any country. But anyway, Julian Assange ran into the Ecuadorian embassy and got asylum. Because they knew he was persecuted. And even they, they dropped the rape charges. They were like, yeah, there's really no evidence. We already, they said, we want to bring Julian Assange back to Sweden to question him about these sexual assault charges with this woman he had dated long after this alleged, and I ain't saying that somebody can't assault somebody and then the woman continues to date. I ain't saying it, it can happen, but when it's a high profile espionage case, then you got to, you know, give it a second look. And my, like I said, I believe black women. I don't believe white women. And if you don't like the fact that I can sit here and say, no, if a white woman especially accuses anybody of something, especially if it's tied to race, espionage, nationalism, of uh, freaking atrocities and, and, and international war crimes, if a woman is hollering in, in, in relationship to all that, I got to give it the side eye and the microscope and the magnifying glass and the sneer and the doubting forehead crumple. I don't believe. I need facts on facts, stacked on stacks. I need evidence upon evidence and confirmation upon confirmation. Because too many of my ancestors hung from trees and too many of my current black brothers are in prisons and black women because of white women's lies. And I already know white women, even though they believe white men, they're above black all other people and they enjoy that status. And they're not about to give that status up. They're not about to betray their racial interests for the, 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 the sake of humanity, at least not yet. We can have another conversation when the, when, the, when the reality changes. But anyway, Julian Assange beat the rape case because there was never a rape case. There was never any evidence. The women who accused him faded into the background or they're up, you know, doing other CIA honeypot schemes. And so then they said, well, Julian Assange is still wanted. They's like, wanted for what? Why can't he leave the embassy now? And say, well, he jumped bail. We wanted him for questioning in a case for a crime we knew he didn't commit, and he did not submit himself to be questioned. And they even said, Ecuador said at the time, if you want to question him, send the investigators to the embassy. If you're saying the only thing you want Julian Assange for is to question him about these allegations, these baseless allegations, send your investigators Send your forensics teams, you want a DNA swab, whatever you want. We have our set up in the embassy to accommodate you. And they're like, no, we need him to come back to, to, to Sweden, even though Interpol and other policing organizations travel to places to do investigations, interviews, collect evidence and DNA samples. They do that all the time. It's routine, especially, you know, in a place like Europe where people are crossing borders day and night. There are being people who commit crimes in the U.S. and they flee to Mexico. Mexico gets them into custody and they have U.S. investigators go down to Mexico before he's extradited back to the United States and to interview him and get the information. It happens routinely across nations all the time, especially when you get an invite and an invitation to do so. But they say, we refuse to come to the embassy to interview Julian Assange. We want you to give him to us. 
And they were like, no, because this smells an awful lot like, maybe if he was just a quote-unquote common criminal, but this is a man who is exposed to crimes of corporations and the most powerful governments and the largest military in the world. And we believe that he it should be afforded some special consideration, being that he has made enemies of the most powerful people in the world who are known for telling lies, and not only telling lies, but killing people who expose those lies. All makes sense. So Julian Assange was in the Ecuadorian embassy and just basically, you know, still doing his work, still telling dirty. And, and after he did the collateral damage, which, shocking surprise, the United States is committing war crimes and atrocities and rapes. There was also an incident where they tried to keep it under wraps, where a U.S. soldier went into a home, raped a 14-year-old girl in front of her uh, in front of her family, and then murdered her and her entire family. And when they talk, brought him in, he's like, I did it because the Iraqis aren't human. And they tried to give this dude like four years and still allow him to, to maintain his military, give him an honorable discharge. It was like a true travesty. And, you know, WikiLeaks leaked that out, those internal documents. And then the U.S. government basically said, if people knew about the, the, the crimes of our military, then they wouldn't support our military. And it would increase the resistance and, and insurgencies against the military. And when the military wants to come into other nations to liberate them and to bring them democracy, people will close the door to the U.S. military. So they're saying that Julian Assange's journalism is harming the interests of the United States. But here's the thing about that. You know, during the uh, Vietnam War, there was so-called secret bombing in Cambodia, La Laos, and they were causing genocidal uh, uh, regimes to come to fore and destabilizing all these other surrounding countries because they believed that the Viet Cong guerrillas were going into the surrounding neighboring countries to hide out, to train, to, to, to recuperate, and then come back into Vietnam and beat the hell out of the imperial forces. So they was like, let's follow them across the border, which is against, again, against the law. And when I say against the law, I never talk about black law, Asian law, African law, uh, any other law but the white man's law. They break their own laws. And here we are shaking a wag and a finger at Jesse Smollett for breaking the white man's law. I don't care about white folks' law. I care about their ability to enforce their law, which is something else. And, you know, it's just for a conscious thing. Y'all might say it's playing games in my head, but so be it. I care nothing of white folks' law. I only focus on their capacity to enforce their laws because they don't obey their own laws. No respect for the law, as Ice-T said. No respect for the law. Because I don't respect the law enforcers, and I don't expect the law makers. But I digress. Let's get back to Julian Assange. But, Ju but Julian Assange, was, and then his next big expose was Edward Snowden. First he was talking about, uh, they got in trouble. Julian Assange told about what the U.S. military was doing abroad. And then Edward Snowden came and dumped some, some, some data on him and told him, yo, they're not just surveying, murdering, and torturing people abroad. They're doing that to Americans. They're spying. Every American is being spied on warrantless wiretaps and all this other stuff. They spy on people through their webcams. They see people having sex or masturbating in front of their webcams. And, and U.S. intelligence agencies and private companies that are contracted with U.S. intelligence agencies are collecting trillions of terabytes a day on American citizens, which is against the U.S. Constitution. Arrest George W. Bush. Arrest Barack Hussein Obama. They are known criminals, international and national criminals. And Julian Assange was like, like to hear it, here it go. He put it out there. Again, pure journalism, legal. And remember, initially, Julian Assange was exposing the crimes of George W. Bush. George W. Bush left office, and Obama went harder in the paint against Assange and whistleblowers than, Obama, than, than Bush did his first weeks in office. Because Obama went into office knowing, and like, y'all think Bush did some dirt. Y'all think Bush was a bomb, crazy, drone bomb, hungry, mass murderer. I'm about to go harder in the paint. I'm about to be a massive murderer, torturer, assassinator, uh, uh, usurper. I'm going to violate sovereignty. I'm going to violate international law. Obama knew he was going to do all this. Before he went into office, he knew he was going to bang hard for the empire. He knew he was going to be a mass murdering international war criminal. 
Because he didn't have no love for Bush. He could have been like, listen, I, all of our, you know, our, our attempts to extradite Assange, I'm dumping that. He didn't expose none of Obama's crimes. He didn't do nothing to Obama. So the only reason Obama had to, to, to continue the assault against democracy, against the rule of law, against Assange and WikiLeaks was if he had every intent on repeating and advancing the crimes of the Bush administration, which he did. And he even hired Hillary Clinton. And Hillary Clinton made it a priority as she was Secretary of State, and this is important, as she was Secretary of State, she made it a priority to get Julian Assange. And she even contemplated, they got these micro drones now. They got these drones that are like the size of a paperclip with an explosive charge, and they can fly it in through the crack of a window and have it blow up in your nostril. I mean, these devils don't quit. You give a, I mean, you think that technology is going to end barbarism? We got high tech, technical, logical barbarism going on here. So she tried to kill Julian Assange. She advocated for the killing. She said, forget it. What's Ecuador going to do? Let's say we kick in the door, wave in the 4-4. What's Ecuador going to do? Ecuador going to invade America, going to sanction America? What can they do to us? Let's just flex our muscle. But Trump, but Obama was like, no, I still want to pretend like the rule of law matters. I still want the facade of democracy and freedom. I still want to give the people that illusion. That's part of my brand. I'm a product. And I was packaged and sold to the American people as change and hope. And he wanted to keep that, you know, for his own personal ego reason. So he wanted to keep his crimes clandestine just like everybody else. So anyway... Julian Assange went about exploding, and Julian Assange, Chelsea Manning, and Edward Snowden, three of the biggest whistleblowers in, 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 in white history, thought that when they give the American people all of this information, all of this data, all of this irrefutable evidence from the horse's mouth, documentation, videos, emails, text messages, and also Julian Assange, everybody thought, yo, it's going to be an uprising. Edward Snowden, Chelsea Manning, Julian Assange thought when you give the people the knowledge, they're going to do something. And what the blood clot did y'all do? Y'all went and watched Game of Thrones. Y'all didn't do nothing. I mean, yeah, they did do something. Americans started getting more into encryption. They started seeking out products. And then advertisers who had worked with the federal government, AT&T, and Apple and Facebook had to start saying, well, now we encrypt your data. Now we promise not to allow the government to use our platforms to spy on you. We started putting little pieces of duct tape or, or post-its or stickers over our webcam when we weren't using our webcam. So we did little minor stuff <laughs> to fight against the surveillance system, the American surveillance system. So I ain't gonna say y'all didn't do nothing. Let me not put the people down, cause I'm for the I'm by for and of the people them. So I'm y'all, y'all me. We didn't do enough in my opinion, but I mean there was enough evidence that we should be rebelling and having all out uprising against the state long before Julian was born. Julian or WikiLeaks first published his first leaked documents. So I've been rebelling since before I even knew what a computer was. But y'all, I guess it's not enough. I mean, what left? What's left to be told? Your government spies on you, it steals from you, it's committing genocide and ecocide, thus it's omnicide against all living things. What will it take for you to rebel? I ask that question all the time and I never get a satisfactory answer. Why aren't you rebelling? But I digress. So anyway, Julian Assange, and this is where I think Julian Assange messed up. Because Julian Assange was pure. He was an angel to the left, to progressives and certain libertarian rights. He was an angel, like a man telling it, telling truth to power. So anarchists, libertarians, leftists, progressives, liberals, true liberals, not the fake democratic neoliberals, but the true liberals. Everybody was like, go Julian Assange, yes. And he's sticking it to the man. But Julian Assange got compromised in the 2016 election. And here's why. Julian Assange, even though he snitched on the George W. Bush administration, he was releasing files as George W. Bush was going out of power. So the bulk of his persecution, his seven, I think it was seven years or eight years that he spent, or nine years, damn, 
I have to look up the date he went and hid in the embassy. But the bulk of that time, 90% of that time, that he was hiding out and losing his mind. He was sick. He, he had a heart condition. And the uh, uh, Ecuadorian embassy said, yo, can we take this guy to the hospital? Can you grant us safe passage so he can get to the hospital? And they were like, no, if he steps foot out the embassy, we're going to lock his ass up. So he had to literally get health care, live his entire life out of two or three rooms in a little small embassy. Couldn't leave the building. Couldn't go outside into the sunlight. Couldn't, you know. Lived his whole life in an embassy. And an embassy is not very accommodating. If you've ever been on tour, especially if you go to New York, I've been on tour in the United Nations. When I was a kid, United Nations building and a few embassies right downtown. They got the uh, Philippines and the Mexican consulate is over there on the west side. So you can go to some government embassy in Chicago. Mainly most of them are in New York around the UN. But anyway, you'll see they're not set up. They're not hotels. They're not set up to accommodate living. So anyway, they said Julian Assange's mental health and physical health was rapidly deteriorating and the British government at the behest of the U.S. government was denying Julian Assange any relief. They were trying to break him. So anyway, the bulk of that time, Julian Assange was being persecuted by the Obama administration for exposing the crimes of the Bush administration. And the person that Obama put in charge of keeping tabs on and trying to see what they could do about Julian Assange was Hillary Clinton. Lo and behold, Hillary Clinton runs for president. And so Julian Assange saw an opportunity to get revenge. So Julian Assange was releasing the, 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 what it, the Podesta emails. He got a bunch of the Podesta emails and started putting out all these internal documents from the Hillary Clinton campaign and the Democratic National Convention. Greatly embarrassing Hillary. And everybody hated Hillary. Like I said, a lot of stuff he does, people already knew. He put out this one thing where she was giving public talks and, and a transcript from a speech she gave. And she went to, to the uh, major corporate leaders and said, listen, I'm going to be out there. I'm running against Bernie Sanders, so I'm going to have to say stuff like uh, economic justice, uh, $15 an hour minimum wage, regulate, break up the big companies. I'm going to be talking a lot of progressive and socialist and left-leaning rhetoric, but let's just know. I'm just saying this crap to get elected. Don't get it twisted. You know I ride for the elite. I bang for the elite. That's my set. And she said this. And Julian Assange put it out. Hillary Clinton's fake. <gasps> what? We've known since 1992 that she was fake. Believe, don't believe white women. I don't really believe women. Don't believe Hillary. So while Hillary was up there talking about, and she brought Madeleine Albright, Janet Reno, and these white women up to talk about feminists, and they said women who don't support other women, uh, uh, there's a special place in hell reserved for women who don't support other women. She was banging on women. She was up there taking hot sauce and shiraksa sauce out of her purse, putting it on her spicy food. She was whipping and nay nay and She went all of its lies. She can't stand black people or other people of color. And she can't stand poor and working class people. And Julian Assange exposed what you should already know. Like I said, the Clintons have been on the at the lead, at the helm of the Democratic Party since 1992. What's left to know? But anyway, he put it out. But what another thing he didn't do, which is commendable. Okay, you exposed the crimes of the DNC, the DLC, the D Democratic Leadership Committee that controls the purse strings, that the finance, the bank of the party, and you uh, exposed Hillary to be the fake scumbag politician that she is. But another thing he did deliberately is he never released anything on Trump. And that was the first time in the history of WikiLeaks where you could say they're playing favors. They're showing bias. Now, there was already a ton of dirt out on Trump. Trump dirty real estate deals, Trump money laundering, Trump's uh, deep relationship with, with, with Russian oligarchs and Russian uh, organized crime syndicates. This guy, David K. Johnston, wrote like two or three biographies of Trump. Trump is in bed with everything from drug dealers to human traffickers, best friends with known human traffickers and pedophiles. On record, on videotape, there was all this dumb. And I really thought, eventually, WikiLeaks are going to get hold of Trump's tax returns and put them out there. I still believe that WikiLeaks had Trump. So, 
Also, there was the speculation that the Kremlin was feeding documents to WikiLeaks. Not just to expose the power elite, but to damage certain elites while helping to prop up other elites. So WikiLeaks allowed itself to be pimped or used by both the Kremlin, and that's why on the campaign trail in 2016, you had Trump out there saying, I love WikiLeaks. I repeat, literally, quote unquote, I love WikiLeaks. And Trump campaign seemed to know which is part of the Mueller investigation, which is why he was accused of collusion, because the Russian government would, would hack. It's a, alleged, all this is alleged. But now they're finding out that, that the, actually the DNC and the Hillary campaign hacks did not come from a foreign server, that it was actually someone within the United States. So if the Russians hacked Hillary, they would have had to come to the United States, set up a hacking hub, and then hack her from within the United States. They said it didn't go to Russia and then come back. But anyway, allegedly, the Russians hacked Hillary and then sent the information to Julian Assange. And then Julian Assange, through intermediaries like Roger Stone, was able to tell Russia, tell the Trump campaign that within 48 hours, this information is going to come back. But we're going to give you the information before we give it to the public in order for you to set up your response. So then these leaks will come out about Hillary. And that same day, within a, less than an hour, you know Trump does not read. I don't know if it's because he just doesn't desire or because he can't read. I speculate that Trump cannot read. Because every time they put a teleprompter on there, he starts freestyling. Now, Obama was a teleprompter pimp. He could, man... You put a teleprompter, Obama, oh, Robama, that's what we should call him, Robot Obama, Robama. That dude was like a machine. He was on that teleprompter, but I digress. So anyway, Trump would come out and say, you know, Hillary, and just know all the details of the, of the contents. Before the, the newspapers could publish the WikiLeaks releases, Trump was out there, you know, in, 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 in bubble butt Iowa at a tractor pool, Running down everything that was in the damn email, in the, in the info dump. And he would dump like 60 million pages. Like, how did Trump get this information? So that was speculate, like, how is something's not adding up here? Trump doesn't read, and he's surrounded by racist idiots. So we don't even know if anybody reads, unless somebody puts a picture and bullet point. So there was speculation that Trump was getting the information. And what pipeline was Trump plugged into that he would get a uh, uh, hacked information put out by a gov by an individual and a news service that's under uh that's under siege by the US government. So even then I thought it smelled fishy. Not that I was weeping for Hillary Clinton. I did not vote for Hillary Clinton. I didn't vote for Bill Clinton. When Bill Clinton served his two terms in office, I've never voted for a Clinton in my life and I never will when Chelsea get her little ugly fish face behind into politics and she's on her way. When she jumps up and she talks about when she runs for office, I will not be voting for that Clinton. I have not and will not vote for Clinton. So she had lost my vote before Julian Assange ever started WikiLeaks. Before I, she even knew she run. I was she lost my vote before she knew she was running for president or any other office. But he put this dirt out. Now I don't think that the Russians and all of that is the reason Hillary lost. I don't blame the Russians. I don't even blame Trump. Hillary lost because of Hillary. But just because you lost, you didn't cause the loss, don't mean you didn't conspire to make her lose. You know what I'm saying? If somebody conspires to run me off the road and I'm driving my car, and before they're able to enact their plan to run me off the road, I yank my own steering wheel and drive myself off the road. And then you say, well, Diallo yanked the, the wheel and, and drove himself off the road. Yes, but that does not mean other people didn't conspire to run me off the road. I just beat them to it. But moving on. So Julian Assange, I felt compromised himself between 2016 and today, 2019. There was at least the appearance of bias or favoritism, which had never happened. If you look back at WikiLeaks history, they went hard against George Bush. 
hard, never stop. And then they went hard against the Obama administration. But then when Obama was exiting office and Hillary and Trump were running for office, they seemed to go hard against Hillary and they didn't have anything to say about Trump who's been a public figure longer than Hillary Clinton. Trump has been on the national stage. Trump has been indicted and, and, and accused and sued and been a, a part of more scandals involving everything from real estate fraud to overt racism, to trying to get innocent black boys executed and locked up for life for a crime he even knew they didn't commit. There was so much dirt, but there were no secrets. Everything we knew, everything there is to know. So I think Julian Assange stupidly thought he had a friend in Trump and stupidly thought he had a friend in the Kremlin, in Vladimir. And then at the same time, before he could start, after the election and Trump was elected, peep this, peep game. Global gangsterism. He was releasing all this dirt on Hillary. Trump was running around the country talking about how he loved WikiLeaks and had all these rednecks who before, when, when WikiLeaks was snitching on the U.S. military, were talking, they were literally saying, kill Julian Assange, send a drone, Obama's weak. If Obama is so weak, he should do something to, uh, about Julian Assange. They wanted Julian Assange dead as fried chicken. They wanted that man dead. But then, less than a decade later, I love WikiLeaks. Yes, and they lock her up, lock her up. When they were screaming, lock her up, that was based on information they got from WikiLeaks. And so Julian was like, yes, I got the rednecks on my side. The same people that wanted to kill me now want to save me from these neoliberals. And so Trump gets into office and then turns around and tries to kill Julian Assange, wants to lock Julian Assange up. And Trump hires people like John Bolton, and other Bush cabinet members who were the first people to get Julian Assange locked up in the embassy in the first place. So Julian Assange was like, yo, I've made a huge mistake. So but before he could start dumping on Trump, he, the Trump administration, Mike Pence, had the Ecuadorian embassy cut Julian Assange off from the Internet. And the Ecuadorian embassy was like, we're taking away your phone, your computer, and you will have no internet access. And the only outdoor contacts they allowed him to have was, was weekly meetings with his legal team. They were like, you cannot no longer engage in journalism or leaks. So they basically shut this dude down. But Julian Assange said, okay, I see the, the writing on the wall. This Lenin guy in Ecuador is going to sell me out. So Julian Assange said, if I'm taken into custody, I have sensitive information. I'm going to dump everything I have. There's a kill switch. Soon as I'm taken into custody, all this information. So information has been coming out and nobody's been covering it. Everybody's been covering his arrest. Everybody's been ignoring some of the information though. So with Julian Assange's arrest means that that's the it for freedom of speech, the, the, the fourth estate, the, the, the uh, integrity of journalism, all that's done, man, on a global scale. And Julian Assange was like, y'all better bang. If they take me into custody, y'all better bang for your own freedom. The, the only reason there was an illusion of democracy was because they were trying to sell capitalism against, up against global communism. After global communism fell, the global elites no longer had to pretend to give a damn. They no longer had to pretend to give a damn about you, about citizens, about workers, about law, about treaties. Nothing from nothing means nothing. So, I didn't plan to talk about the Julian Assange thing, but this is a very important story to follow. Man, I need more than three days a week, two hours on the radio. Let's move on. Uh, Morehouse. I want to talk about Morehouse for a minute. 
It's kind of hard for me to say the word Morehouse College without spitting. And I know Khalil gets mad at me every time I say something about Morehouse. That's a brother of mine in New York, a lawyer, who graduated from a proud Morehouse man. <laughs> and you ever meet somebody that knows stuff, like they on point about everything? You talk to them about politics, economics, history, race, gender issues. They on point about everything, but they got that one thing that you they just turn into a, a sample, step and fetch it. You know, you have a lot of these enlightened, conscious, revolutionary Christians. Like, yeah, Pan-Africanism, liberation, yeah, socialism, yeah. But Christianity is an oppressive. <laughs> Don't talk about my Jesus now. I'm like, how you go from, from, from France for nine to, to, to step and fetch it that fast? Everybody, it's the sacred cow. Every, I guess everybody got something. Everybody holding on to something. No matter how revolutionary, radical, everybody got some delusion or myth. But anyway, I got a homie who graduated. I got a couple of homies. Evans graduated from them. And me and Evans never had, I had, we ain't had much contact, communication, but he's a more. I know a few of my homies that worked hard and strived and went to Morehouse. And I don't know what they be doing to y'all in that old musty-ass Negro college, Negro factory. I don't know what they do, but they, they sure inspire loyalty. Schools I graduated from, they could burn down tomorrow. <laughs> I'd go there and mar roast marshmallows. I guess I just, I'm not, I'm one of them hoes who ain't loyal. I just don't feel those kind of attachments. High school, you could, my city, oh, claim my set, throw your neighborhood in the air. I don't give a damn about nothing, none of that stuff. But I digress. Uh, Morehouse is coming into the 21st century. They have now announced that starting in the year 2020, they will admit transgender men. They're now going to open the school to transgender men. I didn't know they didn't have allowed transgender men up to this point. Because, you know, Morehouse, these Negro colleges, white, ma white daddy say jump, they say how high. So they always want their, these Negro institutions to be completely in tune with what the dominant society wants. They always want to be uh, stand with the status quo. But anyway, that's not what was important to me. I saw that headline and I started reading the article. And I'm like, Morehouse is in Atlanta? And they say Atlanta is like a gay mecca, a LBGTQAI mecca. And then you even have like people like Umar and uh, Imalamu Im Baruti that are talking about how the effeminization and, and the gay mafia taking over the black community and turning uh, the straight pride movement. Everybody talk about Atlanta. I like, I thought Atlanta, Morehouse wasn't letting trans men into the school. If you had told me, hey, bro, Diallo, Morehouse, does Morehouse let trans men into to a, to a team? I'm like, uh, absolutely, I'm sure they do. It's Atlanta. Umar told us that's where the gay agenda, that's the headquarters. That's the nucleus, so I'm pretty sure. But no, apparently Morehouse, they love Jesus more than they love uh, liberal status quo. But anyway, that's not what stood out to me because I already assumed that they did allow transgender men to enroll because Morehouse is an all-male school, by the way. I don't know. I guess I'm not making much sense if you don't. Morehouse is a, a boys only school and Spelman, the sister school, is an all girls school. And uh, that's not what stood out to me. That's not what, that caught my eye. The only reason I saw them like, what? They don't admit them already? 2020? They still got to wait another year? Like, wow. Huh. Who knew? Because I'm not that plugged into y'all Negro institutions. I, I don't want no more Negroes, as Dale Jones said. The Negro college. I don't want no more Negroes. Now, I'm just being nice because uh, Gil Scott called them nigger factories. But I digress. Talented 10. What stood out as I was reading that article, out of pure curiosity, I swear to you, I didn't intend on talk about Morehouse. But the college president, Thomas, said something that really stuck in my throat. He said, and I quote, I had to write it down in my own handwriting because I couldn't believe my eyes. He said, the president, this black man said, Morehouse is the West Point of black male development. 
I'm going to have to back away from the mic again. He said, Morehouse is the West Point. Do you know what West Point is? It's the most elite. It's, it's really, it's, West Point is where it's located. The actual official name is the U.S. Military Academy. And he said that West Point, that Morehouse is the West Point of black male development. And I don't know why West Point wouldn't be West, the, the, the West Point of black male development. But that's what these kind of, and that's why y'all see, I ain't got nothing to say good about these Negro institutions. And every revolutionary from Kwame Ture and all the other revolutionaries that went to these Negro institutions, they became revolutionaries in spite of their education, not because of it. And what is West Point? First of all, let's talk about some West Point graduates like Storm and Norman Schwarzkopf, mass murderer, the general for the first. Now, forget about Storm and Norman. I got a dude that graduated from West Point that makes Storm and Norman look like Noam Chomsky. Do y'all know Jefferson Davis, the president of the Confederate state, the man who led the Civil War, the Confederate side, to, 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 to maintain slavery in the Southern and, and expand slavery out West? Jefferson Davis is a West, Par West Point graduate. Mike Pompeo is a West Point graduate. I could sit here for the rest of the show and name all of these racist, murderous, genocidal war criminals who are West Point graduates. Not only to mention that, rape and sexual assault is an epidemic since 1976. Now, I don't know why you think you West Point when West Point has allowed women to, to, to attend the school since 1976. And y'all still on some old plantation, no, the boy, the, they're from the girls, can't put the boys with the girls and the girl with the boy. Y'all got that Umarian stuff going, all boys school. So I don't know, but but since they've allowed women for, since not, in just one year, between uh, 2016 and 2017, cases of rape and sexual assault more than doubled at West Point. Now, again, I ain't got these stats off head. I had to pull these off. And these are military stats. I don't keep the stats about West Point in my head because West Point to me was just some white military uh, cult of militarism and imperialism. That's where they train imperialists. That's where they train oppressors. I'm going to have to change the name of this show. Because <laughs> today is tax day and I'm not going to get to my notes on the finances of empire. But there's always tomorrow, tomorrow. I love you tomorrow. It's only a day away, so we'll get to it. But this blew my mind that a grown, fully formed, educated black man would brag about his school being the black version of West Point when West Point has always been rape, rapist, has always been racist, has been a bastion of sexual assault that they try to throw under the rug. And not only that, the, the, the racism and macro and micro aggressions have been so aggressive that the black and women West Point uh, graduates had to start their own campaign. And they formed a Black Lives Matter chapter on the West Point campus. And when they formed the Black Lives Matter uh, chapter on the uh, West Point campus, because all these elite creme de la creme white folks was mistreating these black cadets who wanted nothing more to be trained to serve and kill for the empire. Why y'all being racist towards the black people who want to kill on behalf of the empire? So you can follow the hashtag I too am West Point because that's what these insane Negroes got this hashtag called hashtag I too am West Point to talk about all of the, the micro, macro, overt racism that non-white cadets suffer at West Point. And we got the president of Morehouse saying that Morehouse is a black West Point. The blood clot. And also... A lot of white graduates, there's this wonderful article on, that I read about uh, the evangelical cult. And when I read this article where the where, where, uh, president, and I think the president should be forced to resign. David Thomas needs to step down. He should not be presiding over the cultivation of the Negro talented Tim, Jack, and Jill uppity Negroes. They got enough problems already with identity and consciousness to have a Negro this sick in the head to be presiding over a black school. 
the West Point of black male development. And what the, the tragedy is, he's right, it kind of is. But I ain't got to like it. But I got to acknowledge the, the facts, even when I don't like the facts. But another aspect of West Point is a lot of people go there and say, I'm going to get military training. And, you know, there's whole list online. How many engineers, presidents, dignitaries, diplomats, CEOs, prominent entrepreneurs, all these titans of American society that come out of West Point. But the, the tragedy is even though these men uh, uh, elevate to the higher heights, like Mike Pompeo was valedictorian, this guy goes around the world advocating for the torture and mutilation of America's enemies. And i.e. America's enemies are poor people who want to live a life of basic dignity. America's enemies are nations that want to be able to control their own national and natural resources. And he wants to do more than waterboard them. He wants to put electrodes on their, their genitals. And he learned this at West, at, at, at West Point. This value system, this mentality came from West Point. And we got Morehouse, which I remember people used to say, Morehouse is the Black Harbor. That's what I thought, which was bad enough. But no, West, Morehouse, according to the current president, is the West Point. And it's an evangelical cult. So even white progressive, even white liberals, even white people with some sense in their head said, I dropped out of uh, uh, West Point because it's supposed to be a, a U.S. military school. And they required me to go to all these cultish evangelical assemblies. And it was such obvious. I thought I was going to be indoctrinated into the military. And I went there to be indoctrinated into uh, fascism, Christian fascism fascism, white nationalist Christian fascism. I didn't sign up for that. I just wanted to be the run of the mill imperialist. And they are exposing. So it's it basically West Point is an evangelical fascist cult. And this is what the president of Morehouse is aspiring to? To hell with letting in the trans. I thought the trans men were already allowed. But I couldn't believe this. I could not believe it. Man, and, and I, I did a series of comments about these Negro institutions. I got in real big trouble because I said some things I didn't have to say about these historic HBCUs. These stupid, stupid HBCUs. And anybody that believes anything about, oh, we the black strivers, the black excellence, black decadence, Black reactionary decadence. That's what it is. That should be the hashtag. Talking about the way. I mean, how how dare you? I, I'm gonna stop talking about that because I'm sick of losing listeners. I, I want to. I don't want to be isolated. Cause I know how y'all are about these Negro colleges. I know how y'all are. That's something y'all need to pay attention to, too, man. When people, when people, when somebody tell, who did, who did Mario Angelou say it? When people show you who they are, believe them. You gonna see your your your, your budding young, brilliant black folks? Yeah, some of the smartest, sharpest black folks I know. But I'm like, you're so smart. Why the hell are you so goddamn stupid? Now, now, now I ain't saying you, Khalil. I know you graduated. You're the one one that got out of there with your head together. <laughs> Khalil and Evans, shout out to my man Evans. We went to high school together. Hell, we've been through more. We were in a bad car accident together. Evans graduated from our house. Evans and Khalil, they the only two that made it out with their minds intact. All the rest of y'all Negro. I don't know. I ain't trying to catch no beef because, you know, in case my homies still listen to my show. But man, if uh, Harvard, as uh, they say, if Harvard has ruined more Negroes than bad whiskey, then Morehouse then ruined more Negroes than turned chitlins. <laughs> and that's all, man, man. Hey, hey, get mad if you want. Get mad if you want. Because, uh, I'm upset. I, I live in a constant state of rage. Wednesday, I need to talk to y'all about the Israeli election. Y'all keep playing with this Israel stuff. 
And some of y'all foolish black people be out there talking that, I don't care nothing about no Palestine. What do Palestinians ever do for me? Let me tell you something the Palestinians have done for all of us. To the best of their ability, they've tried to attenuate the Zionist horde. For every act of resistance that the Palestinians engaged in, that reduced the capacity for Israel and the Greater Israel Project to unleash its racist repression against Africa. Remember, Israel was allied with all of the settler colonial and, 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 and imperialist states in Africa. They gave arms, material support to South African regime, the Rhodesian white minority, and all of the anti-colonial reactionary forces, the tribal conflicts, they fed and gave weapons and validation in Africa. The cops that are patrolling your community right now, many of them have been to Israel to train in urban suppression tactics. Many of the technologies of surveillance and containment were, let me tell you something, Palestine and the West Bank are laboratories for repression. There are laboratories for state oppression of population. Palestine, the, the Gaza Strip, has the highest land density on the planet Earth. That's individuals per square mile. And they've used everything from biochemical warfare to sedatives in the food and water to see what works to take a population of people who are under-resourced and discriminated against and prevent them from acting out in rebellion. And as the Israel literally goes around, comes to the United States, goes to all these cities that have black populations and tell them, listen, we have technology, we have substances, we have tools to allow you. Just like in Ferguson, Missouri, the Ferguson cops go to Israel to learn how to suppress their population and how to extract wealth and prevent rebellion. So the Palestinian resistance is actually the frontline soldiers, just like the Iraqi insurgents rescued the world from World War III. The very people we say are the terrorists actually rescued us. And I know this is uncomfortable for you to hear because you want to think your cousin in the, in, in the army, you think your auntie that went to the Navy while they're not being discriminated against, while they're not being sexually assaulted, where they're not being denied their benefits, when they're not going through all that, they're at least fighting for your freedom, to protect your freedom and, and, and protect your rights. But no, the United States is the bad guy. You watch Star Wars, you're on the Darth Vader side. America is the Darth Vader side. Luke Skywalker wouldn't have been a blonde-haired, blue-eyed blue white boy. Luke Skywalker is an African refugee. Luke Skywalker, if, it, if Star Wars came, would be an Iraqi insurgent. Chewbacca would have been a Palestinian. You know what I'm saying? If we had to just bring it, take it out of the stars and put it on Earth. So the U.S. soldiers are the stormtroopers. Trump is Darth Vader's. The emperor would be the head of the Fed, would be Jamie Dimon. You see how that works? And oh yeah, you who aren't in the military, who aren't in the government, you see those people walking around in those fancy weirdo robes and those fancy headdresses? all around the emperor's court and on Tatooine, all the people living good, sitting around Jabba the Hutt. That's you. You're not the good guy. America isn't the good guy and your American citizens are not the good guys. You know, oh, Trump is Cersei Lannister, whatever. If you're in the game of, everybody's Game of Thrones crazy now. I'm sick of hearing about Game of Thrones. Sick of your Game of Thrones means sick of all that mess. The Trump, Cersei Lannister, and you're the citizens of Restoros. 
That's it. You're not the good guy. Who are there? There are no good guys in Game of Thrones. That's so accurate. Who are the freaking good guys? Who are the noble? I guess y'all think y'all are the Starks. No, you're not the Starks. You're a freaking Lannister. <laughs> Americans are the Lannisters. <clears throat> okay? The Hondurans, they're the Starks. I don't even know if that fits because the Starks are problematic too. But anyway, Bro Diallo Show, Q4 Radio, AM 1680. Go to DialloKenyatta.com to catch past shows and archives. Diallo Kenyatta slash YouTube slash Twitter slash Facebook to keep up with me on social media and links and other things. Next week, we're still going to actually talk about the economics of empire. Today is tax day. Pay your taxes. And remember, don't listen to the stupid libertarians. Taxation is not theft. Profit is theft. Your employer is robbing you, not the government. The government is corrupt when they misappropriate your tax dollars and spend $1.5 trillion on bomber planes while the infrastructure erodes and so on and so forth. But hey, we live under the empire. So y'all need to join the rebellion. Y'all need to get your Luke Skywalker on, get your Chewbacca on, get your Han Solo on, get your Princess Leia on. Because that's not who any of you are. I know we all imagine when we watch those movies, we, we think we identify with them, but y'all should be identifying. You know, Darth Vader and the Emperor, they are capitalist. And then, the you know, Boba Fett, he's the police. Yeah, I'm just doing, all of my shows from here forward, I'm just going to use pop culture references to explain current reality. I enjoy it. And it's not even because I think people are dumb. It's just I, I'm kind of into that stuff. We can go next week. We'll talk about how the X-Men, the mutants, represent the oppressed uh, uh, minorities. <laughs> All right. Q4 Radio. Did I say that? AM 1680 if you're in the city of Chicago. Q4.org. You can listen online. Tune in app. Download that. And iTunes Radio. We everywhere. We out here. But in order to remain out here, I need some support in here. So, you know, go to the Patreon, please share, subscribe, notification, get the show out. And again, share the shows, not just with your friends, lovers, and allies, but share it with your enemies. Piss them off. Bring a little storm cloud to their life. Q4 Radio. Let's hear some more heat music. Bung dung, burn down Bobby Line. I'm going to play heat fire music until the temperature rises to an appropriate level. Mid 50s at least. All fire theme music. We we gonna go the other way. No more ice music. I was threatening y'all with playing ice ice baby, but I'm not gonna do that. I'm gonna not complain to the universe about what I got. I'm gonna ask the universe for what I want. And let's see if we can play some fire theme music to get some some sunlight. So, but everybody telling me my spinach gonna be fine. We'll see if I'm right. I hope I'm wrong, and I hope y'all right. My spinach and my turnips and my beets, and my gourds. I know my gourds are just done. They're doomed. I'm going to have to go replant those. And I'm sorry, David, we spent all Saturday before last clearing the area, planting those gourds, and I think it was all for nothing. So I'm going to head to Home Depot and get some organic gourd seeds. Oh, you don't need the gourds to be organic, but, you know, Dr. Mingo won't let me plant any non-organic seed. I got this non-organic seeds, and she won't let me plant them. Snooty uppity. I have to see if she went to Spelman. She claims she went to UIC. I don't know how she gets so uppity. I think she went to an HBCU and she lying. Because she know I don't mess with uppity Negro. A negresses. <laughs> anyway, shout out to uppity negresses. Kiki, shout out. And, and Cleo, shout out. Anyway, listen to them too. If you want a, a feminist perspective. Not a feminist, but a feminine. I don't know. Whatever, man. Every time I say something, I get in trouble. Everything's too technical and specific. Anyway, no more delay. Muta Baruka Bung Dong Babylon. At least that's what it was supposed to be. But again, everybody's against me. Everything is against me. It is not just in my head. Let's try it again. Bung Dong Babylon. Muta Baruka. What in the... I don't know what's going on here. Oh, there we go. All right, move to Baruch. I